Hi, Bridge City. Happy Mother's Day. I'm Amanda. And I'm Natalie, and happy Mother's Day to you. You too. Look who's here, Daisy. Happy Mother's Day. This is awesome. Hey, and if you're new here, we would love for you to fill out the form, click that link, and um, just be able to put in your information so that you can keep up to date on all of the happenings here at Bridge City. Yes, and we would love to send you a gift card for a coffee. We have a lot of exciting things coming up at Bridge City, and one of those things is Growth Track. Right, and do you know that's on Sunday, May 19th? Yes, it is. It's awesome. from five to eight. It is. Five to it eight is. at North Braddock. That's where you're gonna go for Growth Track. Um, and I know for me, one of the things about Growth Track that I've loved is going through each and every one of those tracks mm -hmm. is growing with Jesus, learning new things, learning new ways to develop my faith, and it has really strengthened my walk with Jesus. Yeah, and so you can attend and, you know, no matter where you are in uh, life, there's always something to learn. Yes. And I know myself, I also completed all of the different tracks and I'm on the... Um, the electives. The electives. Yes. So I feel excited about that. And also I'm excited because I have also served in the kids portion of this, the ministry to the kids fifth grade and under. <laughs> yeah. And they have a great setup for them yes. as well. Yep. And it's open, but you have to sign up before May the 13th in order to get your child uh, a spot. Registered, yeah. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow will be the last day for that to get your kids um, K through fifth grade. So childcare will be provided, just sign up for that. Okay, another thing that we have coming up at Bridge City is our Victory and Freedom Weekend. We are going to have that on June 7th and 8th. It will be Friday evening and then all day Saturday. Um, and Natalie, you want to tell them a little bit about Victory and Freedom? Sure. Um, they're separate ones for the men and for the women, and it's really just a lot of uh, following the life of the prodigal son through all of the different teachings. Um, as far as getting victory over our past and the ability to walk in freedom yes. in our in our future lives and it's just been a real joy it's been uh, a place where i have received so much healing mm -hmm. by attending so you want to get uh to the connection point or register online today yes, absolutely <laughs> it's definitely something you want to get to and don't want to miss Hey, so now we're going to get ready to worship, and I just want to invite you to sing along, stand up, just be free in worshiping Jesus. Let's go! Yeah, 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 yeah.
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, he's never let me down, faithful I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I built my life on Jesus. He never let me down. He's faithful. 
came when blue but my house was built on you I say with you I'm gonna make it through rain came when blue but my house was built on you I You never fail. Just give the Holy Spirit a moment. I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Is your name is
Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus, shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. Hey everyone, we're gonna continue to worship God with our offering, our tithes and our offering. Yes, um, God calls us to be cheerful givers. And I think especially important to mention on Mother's Day is as mothers, we love being cheerful givers. We love selflessly giving to our children and God does the same for us. And I think one of the things that we can do for him is to just give back just as selflessly. Um, and we can do that with our tithing. And I think it's just very important to remember those points whenever we are, you know, posturing our hearts and looking into what we should be giving back. Yeah, so there's a link right there and it's all pretty self-explanatory. Just follow along the way you'd like to give. Yes. Thank you so much in advance for your givings. And we are going to get ready now to hear a message from Pastor Rick. I'm a mom. Of course I never thought I'd be so excited that somebody pooped. I'm a mom. Of course I catch vomit with my bare hands. <sighs> I'm a mom, of course I, no, 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 don't touch that. I'm a mom, of course I don't go to the bathroom alone. Let's do this. I'm a mom, of course I have a bag full of things just in case. What do you need? Snacks? A toy? Band-aids? Baby shoe? I'm a mom, of course I do calculus every time I have to figure out when I have to leave the house. He takes a nap, he wakes up, feed him at like 11. Maybe I can be out of the house one-ish, maybe two, but if he, Oops, I gotta change the diaper and that's... I'm a mom. Of course I absolutely love my kids. And I believe they're gifts from the Lord. I would, I would do, do anything, anything for, for them. them.
Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. So glad that you're joining us here for what do we believe about God is worth passing on. Pastor Ben Kendrew, our Brighton Heights campus pastor, said that in seminary he learned something very, very important. That there were three holy days every year. There's Easter, Christmas, and Mother's Day. Hey, where would we be without the moms out there? Here it is, Psalm 145, verse 4. One generation will praise your works to the next one, proclaiming your glorious and wondrous and mighty acts. Yes, this is what it's all about. It's like about passing on our faith to the next generation. Now, I don't know where you are, but, but as a parent and as a mom, you may view yourself a certain way. But I guarantee you that your kids and maybe even grandkids view you differently. Natalie and I, we have the joy of uh, our first two grandchildren. We have one on the way. But our first grandson, he's two years old, and recently when his mom was taking him through the grocery store, he, he identified somebody that looked like me. And when his mom said, who is this? He would say, Pops. Yes, Robert Irvine from Restaurant Impossible. As you can see that picture there, it looks just like me. Yeah, all bulked up and looking good. What I'm trying to say is this, is that it's easy to view ourselves a certain way, but the next generation views us a completely different way. They don't see our flaws. They don't see our imperfections. What they see is they see a representation of something really, really good, and it's from God. And that's what I want to talk to you about today is how do we impact a generation? What I'm communicating to you today is not only for moms or for dads or for parents. It's for Christians, Christians who want to pass on their faith to the next generation. That's what's so vitally important here. What do we believe? It all comes down to these three questions. We've been covering them. What do we believe about he? That's God, our theology. What do we believe about me? That's my identity. And what do we believe about we? That is we as a people. He, me, and we will determine all of our decisions. So how do we pass on our faith to a generation using this as a template of how we do this? See, if we want to move forward, first, we need to move back. Yeah, we're going to pick up a story here, and it's in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to look at nine verses today. But it was at a critical time in history. But before I look there, let's look at the time in history that we are right now. Yes, we're at a critical, critical time in history, in the United States of America, even our whole world for that matter. But let's look at a couple things. Gen X... Now, Gen X is, is actually late 1900s there. And, and when they grew up, they were the most churched generation growing up as kids as ever before. More dollars went in, into programs for kids during that time in their Christian faith than in any other time in history. What's interesting that the Gen Xers right now, yeah, those like 40s and all right in there, that they, as they grew up, now they're the least churched. They've given up on God completely. Well, the millennials, yeah, late 80s, early 90s, they grew up. And matter of fact, right now, again, not the most, but one of the most churched generations because most of the millennials really didn't even grow up in church, but they were, they were one of the top, but not the, just for clarity. Right now, one third of the millennials refer to themselves as the duns. That's right, I'm done. They have no religious affiliation at all. What we have learned with Gen X and the millennials is this, is that we can throw a lot of money at things, we can do a lot of, have a, little, a lot of programs, but if we don't have the right culture, I believe church culture, family culture, to be able to pass on faith to them, then we're gonna miss it. And I don't wanna miss it. I don't want you to, you to miss it at all. So that's what research tells us. Research tells us that, that just more money and more programs won't do it. So how do we pass on faith to one another? Even those of us and you that are new to the faith, even as adults, how are we trained up and equipped in our faith formation? Because we do not want to have this in Judges chapter 2. After that generation died, this is the generation actually talking that I'm going to talk about in Deuteronomy here, died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember his mighty acts in Israel. We do not want this to happen. We do not want the end of the book of Judges. Everybody doing what's right in their own eyes. But that's where we are in history right now. 
Yeah, right now in history, we are at that place where people are doing what's right in their own eyes. Everybody has become a God unto themselves. And how do we learn from this? How do we get past this? So we're gonna look at some foundational principles. Here is the big idea. Are you ready for the big idea? You're gonna to wanna to catch this. What we believe will be passed on when we become a generation. Yes, a generation that lives out covenant, commandment, and communication. That's what we have. Here's a quote for you. Legacy, remember this, legacy is not leaving something for someone. Legacy really is leaving something in someone. What do we impart inside of them, not just for them? Deuteronomy, fifth book in the Bible. Yeah, fifth book in the Bible. And it's a story here. See, Leviticus, it's an earlier book, two books earlier than this one. It was, that book was from Moses, written to the Levites, the priests, who were in charge of sacrifices and making sure that offerings were pleasing to God. Deuteronomy, it's written to people like you and me, ordinary, everyday people, about how are we going to, how are we going to obtain the promises of God? How are we going to live these out? This is it. It's a farewell from Moses. They were standing on the plains of Moab looking at the promised land. They could see the promises, but they were not experiencing the promises here. So Moses is giving them very, very specific instructions about what to do here. Let me just give you another interesting thing. Jesus, Matthew chapter 4, New Testament. Jesus, when he was facing uh, temptation, in Matthew chapter 4, you want to write that down, you want to look it up. He was facing temptation from the devil. He quoted Old Testament scripture. All three of the scriptures that Jesus quoted came from Deuteronomy. Could there be a correlation between a generation being able to face their culture, face temptation, face the, all the things that they face in the world that goes back into our roots and foundation, into our faith foundation of Deuteronomy? Jesus quoted Deuteronomy. See, the Old Testament and New Testament are very, very connected books. And if we want a generation of new Christians, new believers, trying to figure out who God is, and even our kids, to live life with God and for God, then we need to have these foundations in our lives. Let's pick it up, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. Here we go. These are the commands and the decrees and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey in the land you are about to enter and occupy and you, your children and grandchildren, must fear God, fear the Lord your God, as long as you live. If you obey all these decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Obedience, enjoy a long life. Verse 3, then listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God, your ancestors promised you. So here we have the first point. It was all about covenant. What Moses was communicating to God's people, that we are a covenant people. Yeah, that's what we are here. Now, the, this word covenant, we don't use that in our, in our culture, in our terminology. Covenant, what's, what's different from a contract, a contract is made to be broken. A covenant is saying, I'm gonna do my part. We have a covenant with God. See, God has a covenant with his people, his church. So if we want the covenant promises of God, then therefore we are part of a church. Remember, we, who are we as a people? Yeah, so God does his part, we do our part. It's an agreement here. That's what covenant really is. Covenant in the word testament, we use the word Old Testament, New Testament. Testament and covenant are associated words. Testament has the, has the connotation of after somebody dies, what's passed on to you. That's the testament. But this word covenant, so really, what if we thought about this? In the Old Testament, first two-thirds of the Bible, we thought of it as the, the, the Old Covenant or the old agreement with God, then there's the new covenant, New Testament. 
This is the new agreement with God. You need both. You need the Old Testament and New Testament to fully comprehend who God is because one leads into the other. That's connected. One reflects, one fulfills here. So I'm just trying to give you, see, see, covenant is different because if you break a covenant, there's moral problems. That's what it really has. If you do it, there's an agreement between you and others here. And if you, it, 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 it's considered immoral to break a covenant. That's right, immoral here. It's a betrayal of trust when a covenant is broken, different from a contract here. See, God led, the, led his people out of a place of bondage and slavery, which is called Egypt in the Old Testament, to a place not where they could be free to do whatever they wanted, but so that they could be God-led and live a covenant relationship with God. So covenant is very important. Verse 2, it speaks of the fear of God. Fear, well, let, get, let me give you a working definition of the fear of God. To love what God loves hate what he hates, and live a life that we know will stand before God and give an account. That is the fear of God. Love what he loves, hate what he hates, but live like we're going to stand before God and give an account. Key. Fear is connected to running to God, running with him here. So the priorities of our life, our time, our money, the priorities of everything about us, they, do they scream the fear of God as if we're going to stand before God? Or do they scream that this is as good as it gets in the here and now? I'm going to live for my pleasure, for my joy, and all those things that come with it here. So Moses was reminding them, children, grandchildren, hey, your life matters and what you pass on matters here. So let's look at verse 3 here. It talks about the promises of God. So here we go. We are saved by believing in God's promises. Not, I'm going to make more promises to God, but how about we, we stop making promises to God, but make a commitment to believe God's promises. Let's switch that around a little bit. See, I want to believe God's promises, not just make more promises to Him. Big game changer here. So, so I'm going to live a life with, for my children and my grandchildren and even for those in the context of Jesus' church who are coming into the church, beginning a relationship with God. I want to help them and do everything within me to help them believe the promises of God and live those out. It's sowing and reaping. Blessings and curse. This is what a generation does not understand and not know. They do not understand that, 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 that actions have consequences. For the parents out there, vitally, vitally important. Our kids need to know that our actions have consequences, that what we do matters, and it matters deeply here. That's what covenant is. That's what that agreement with God has, and that it goes generationally. Even in our church, for 42 years, we have a generational church, passing on from one generation to another, faith formation. May God grant us the grace to continue to do that and not be a people who break covenant, which betrays trust and is immoral. Okay. So here we go here. What we believe will be passed on to a generation when we live covenant, but then the next one is commandment. So let's uncover what this commandment really looks like. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands I am giving you today. This, these couple verses are key in the Jewish culture, even still today. And they're just as important to you and I in the way we live. And they determine what we really believe. The Lord our God is one. Yeah, again, the connotation of plurality in there, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but our Lord God is one and there's only one God. 
Again, written in the context of Deuteronomy at that time, they were going into a culture. There were many gods, small g. There were many ways to heaven. There were many different belief systems. But the one we have, it's different. The Lord our God is one and only one. So here we have what is referred to as the Shema, to hear. Yes, to hear, to pay attention here. In the Jewish culture, even today, a good Jew, and I'm saying that very respectfully, they would repeat this. They would repeat this every morning and every evening. They literally say these words out loud. Now, in Jewish culture, as it, as it has progressed here, there's actually a few other verses, actually, that they quote every morning and every evening out loud to remind themselves, to pay attention to what matters most. And I gave you those verses there. Here, so this is what grounds us. This is, what, this is where our foundation really, really comes from. See, we, see, if we're gonna find out who we are and what we believe, it goes back into here. It goes back into Deuteronomy. That, that is so important. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy, as I said. So important here. Now let's look at another example. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus is being questioned on what's the most important commandment. At that time in the New Testament, New Covenant being revealed, here we had there were 613 commandments that the Jewish people needed to obey. And they're saying out of 613, what's the most important? Well, Jesus answers this and he says the most important commandment, verse 29, Listen, O Israel, the Lord your God is, is one, the only Lord. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, added mind, yeah, and strength. Interesting here. Jesus referred back to this. Most of us think, well, of course he's Jesus. He knew exactly what to say. He has discernment and knowledge. Well, let me give you another idea. Jesus, probably at this point, for the last 26, maybe even 27 years of his life, quoted Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, he quoted that every morning and every evening. Could it be that he knew what was central in his life, in a foundation of his life that was found with God's rule back in Deuteronomy? He was quoting out loud something that he would have quoted years and years and years, two times a day. What would happen if you and I, in our homes, were starting to quote Bible verses every morning and every evening, and we got them to be a part of our lives, that the command of God, loving Him, and, 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 and serving Him, and pleasing Him, was the number one central thing in all of our lives. And later on, it, when Jesus is communicating in Mark chapter 12, in, 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 in the man he's talking to that's questioning him, he's saying, I'm starting to believe what you've got. And Jesus almost says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. To begin understanding the kingdom of God is to begin understanding the greatest commandment. Love God, love people. But here, that, that's so important here. See, Jesus knew that everything else flows from here. And at, if we're going to pass on our faith, everything flows from here. We live in a culture. Yeah, our culture is so fixated on God loves me and does God love me. God loves everybody. You don't hear a lot of people talking about loving God. Yeah, loving God with all your heart. Okay, all your heart. In the Hebrew culture, in the Hebrew culture here, to, to a Jew, this not, it wasn't emotional. It was where intellectual ability and decision making came from. See, the Hebrew word for heart was really this, they referred to it actually in the central part of your, your body, not even just what we know as heart. So it was the central part of your being where all life came from. But it wasn't emotional. We use heart as just share your heart, it's emotional. No, it's intellectual. It's where creative ability comes from, the ability to think. Critical decision making comes from heart. See, Jesus speaking to a Greek culture in Mark chapter 12, added mind because the Greek culture, like the Gentile, we're not Jewish, so we're, we're, we, we don't come from that mindset. He had to add mind so they understood that your intellectual ability needs to love God. Then soul, the wholeness of your being here. We refer to soul a lot in church as the mind, will, and emotions here. But again, that's an overlap from heart. It's the wholeness of who you are. And then strength, 
means literally muchness, muchness. With everything you got, we're going to love God here. And see, we cannot pass on to a generation that which we don't possess. Is there enough evidence in our lives that says that we love God with our heart? Jesus, I'll use mine too, just so we can understand it, soul and strength. Because that's what we need to pass on to a generation. That's what we pass on to, 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 to our children and grandchildren, nieces and nephews. That's the best gift that we could give right there. Okay, here we go. Transition time. It's about to get practical because what we believe will be passed on to a generation when we live covenant, the commandment, loving God with all our heart, soul, strength, in Deuteronomy. And then, then what we're going to live now is communication of that to others. See, if you don't have the first two, the covenant with God and the commandment of God, and we're not living those, then we really don't have much to pass on. Our communication is going to be meaningless. Let's think for a moment. One of the top reasons that millennials give that they don't go to church anymore, and even you know, moving into the next generation after that, that they give is that the people in church don't really believe the Bible. They don't live the Bible. What an indictment against us who are older that the younger people have seen our lives and they see that we're not living the love of God in practical ways, that we're harsh and mean. Oh yes, but we need to look at the full counsel of God. But, but, but that's why they don't participate because we have said one thing, but we're living another. May God help us live a different way, even as a result of this message. What do I believe about the covenant of God? What do I believe about the commandment of God? And what do I believe about what I can pass on to others here? So let's keep reading in Deuteronomy 6, verse 7. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. What basically Moses is saying here is that faith formation, knowing who God is, takes place every day, all day. That's what it means. There's never a time our kids aren't watching. There's never a time that like grandkids and nieces and nephews and even kids in our church aren't watching. They're learning by the way that we treat, that we treat each other, by, we, by the way we treat the covenant of God. Do we honor God or are we honoring ourselves? That's a key right there. So this word here, this repeat, this talk, it's, 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 a, word by, it's a word which we see in, it's the impression of indelible sharpness and precision. Now, teach also in here has a connotation of sharpening as a blade, as a, as, as a wet stone, like sharpening a blade. I don't know if you've ever seen that with a, with a sharp blade. But it also has this, this connotation also. If we are going to see a generation, even in our church, and even with your, with your kids and grandkids, it's going to have the impression of a chisel and a hammer. That's right, chisel and hammer right here. This is what they have. See, what we have to be able to see them and we have to see that there's something inside of them that needs chiseled away. That's right. The outside needs chiseled away. All the stuff of the culture and the world and all this thinking that we have because we see something inside of them worth passing on. We see something so vitally important in them that, that, that what we want to do is we want to see the best of God come out in them. And so we're going to sharpen them, but the way we sharpen them is this. And I want to tell you, as a parent or a pastor or as a disciple maker or as a mentor, passing on faith to another generation, every now and then, somebody's going to get nicked and they're going to bleed but surely they will not die. Yes, see every now and then when somebody's chiseling away, oh, that hurt. And yeah, there's gonna be some nicks and a little bit of blood along the way. 
But we're not going to allow that to stop us from forming a generation of what do we believe about here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your, all your heart, your soul, and again, Jesus said, mind and strength. And then you should love others. Yeah, this is important. We have a commandment. We have a, we, we, we have a covenant. And now we're going to communicate about God. How are we going to do it? When are we going to do it? Yes, we're going to do it all the time. We're going to, how often do we do this? We, we, we have drive time. We have, we have bedtime. We have getting up time. We have dinner time. We have all these times that we need to do it. All these times are vitally important. Now, they said, strap these on. And some people take this literally. Put Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 through 9. Some people actually put it on their hands and they wear it on their forehead. Well, there's this thing in Jewish culture called the mezuzah. And actually, in, in this mezuzah here is, is literally Deuteronomy 6. And uh, they're repeating it in the morning, they're repeating it at night, but they put it on their doorposts. And in Jewish culture, as they walk by in and out of their house, they touch it. It would be similar to touching the Word of God. And there's sometimes some other verses that they repeat in the Shema. What they're saying is this is important. They're not just touching this as a magical potion or a religious activity. They're saying, I believe that the Lord our God is one. There's only one God. I believe that we're going to live out the covenant of God, blessing and cursing, fear God. I remember the commandments of God, and I need to communicate these to a generation. What would it look like in all of our homes if we did that? If we put something right there, we touched it every time, like live like a champion today. Yeah, what would happen if we would do that? We teach, we talk, we chisel, we sharpen. We do this at all times. That's what we do. And that's why we do at, growth, at, well, at, at Bridge City Church, we have growth track coming up. Growth track is not just telling you what you should believe. It's giving you a, a faith formation in how you can believe it. See, we're not just giving you fish. We're teaching you how to fish. That's what growth track is coming up. We have victory and freedom weekends, a weekend retreat designed to help us deal with victory over our past so we can live in our future. For every parent, for every person out there that says, I want my children or grandchildren to have it better off than me, victory and freedom. It's a Friday night and all day Saturday from 8 a.m. till 9 p.m. that you go to this entire thing, but it's designed to clean out the cobwebs of your heart and life so that you're free to live like Jesus wants you to live. So important here. So I wanna help us get practical here. Statistically right now, in many different studies, USA Today, the, uh, there's a John Daner study, there's a Barna study, there's, all of them are saying the same thing, that out of the kids who grow up in church, 75% that grow up in church will not live lives with God. After they grow up, they leave church and they're gone. It used to be a couple more come back. Unfortunately, they're leaving for good. Only 25%, even if they have faith hiccups along the way, will still be in the church. So they surveyed and they found five common denominators of the 25% that are still in church. Let's take a look together. Number one, this is what they have. They ate dinner together five out of seven nights a week. Five out of seven nights a week. That's no TV, no distractions, no cell phones, communication together. Pretty simple, right? Just make a dinner time and stick to it. I know, five kids growing up, we had a hard time keeping dinner time. And there were times during baseball season and during other seasons, we would have dinner literally at nine o'clock at night. We would have dinner at different times. But that's just kind of the way we did it. You know, because dinner time was important. So we would sit together and we would eat with no distractions. Number two, they served with family members in ministry served with family members in ministry. That's right, they were a part of ministry in a local church. And they did it with maybe mom or dad, or maybe with a brother or sister, but they did it together. Number three, I want you to catch this one. One weekly time, one week, not every day, but one time a week, there was a spiritual experience in their home where they realized they, they realized that, that, that something about God, there was some toward, sort of teaching or worship or activity that was spiritual in the home. 
Think about that, parents. Just one time a week, there's gonna be a spiritual experience in your home. Number four, they were trusted with ministry and ownership of ministry at a young age. That's right, as soon as they got old enough to, to work with younger kids, maybe in children's ministry, or serving food at a food distribution, or a missions trip, they took ownership for ministry at a young age. And number five, they had one faith-focused adult in their life. That's a fancy way of saying, outside of the home, they had one adult who helped them live their faith out on a regular basis. Somebody they could go to to ask questions, somebody they could go to to follow up and, and find out you know, things about faith and, and life. How important somebody is to our kids. Those five practical points also work for those that were discipling and mentoring and helping learn who Jesus Christ really is and leading us to God the Father with the help of God the Holy Spirit. Wow, so here it is. If what we believe will be passed on to a generation, if we live out the covenant of God, the command of God, and then communicating it, teaching it, do our, does our teaching, our talk, and our lives match up? This is so vitally important. For all of those out there right now that you're desiring to make, to, to make a difference in the next generation, whether it's with your own family or extended family members, or even in church. I wanna pray for you right now. I'm believing God that we are gonna to continue to be a generational church. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for each and every one of us, God. And I thank you that inside of us, you put, Lord God, the desire to affect a generation, not just leaving something for others, Lord God, but leaving something inside of others. Lord God, grant us the grace to live for a generation and pass our faith on the true faith in Jesus and God the Father based on biblical principles of Deuteronomy 6. Thank you, God, for the awesome privilege to do this. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for being with us today. I really, really appreciate it. Do not turn off at this point. We have some great, great opportunities and some things that the ladies are gonna be sharing with you right now. And next week, Come back to learn what does Pentecost really mean. We're going to recognize the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. That's where we are. Come on back and see what do we believe about Pentecost. If you decided to make today the day to make Jesus the forgiver of your past and the leader of your future, just go ahead and click the button that says, I want to know Jesus, and somebody from our team will get in touch and they will pray with you. Yeah, so hey, we just wanted to say, Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Thanks for being with us here online. Thank you.